Okay, good afternoon to, every, to all of you. So just a, a quick word of uh, introduction. I'm Mario Sharma. I'm the uh, professor and chair of obesity research and management here at the University of Alberta. Uh, it so happens I actually practiced at the Charité, which was the home institution of Burkhold. Uh, he was just there a long time before I was. So uh, I've been in Canada for about 10 years now. I've, uh, I came here from Germany. Uh, my clinical work right now involves uh, uh, work in the bariatric clinic, which is uh, uh, perhaps one of the largest obesity clinics, um, certainly in Alberta. The term bariatrics now, uh, how many of you have heard the term bariatrics know what it means? Okay, bariatrics is the field of medicine that deals with large people. So pediatrics is medicine for little people, and geriatrics is medicine for old people. And bariatrics is the whole field of medicine that deals with large people. Uh, it's commonly used in, the, in connection with the term bariatric surgery. So a lot of people, when they hear the term bariatric surgery, they think of you know, gastric bypass surgery or stomach stapling. Uh, but there's also bariatric medicine, there's bariatric psychology, there's bariatric uh, pharmacology. Uh, it's the entire field of medicine that deals with uh, obesity. Uh, and one of the reasons we have to deal with obesity uh, almost as, a, as its own medical discipline is because it has become extremely common uh, a problem. Uh, but it hasn't, uh, but obesity has always existed. You can go back to the Stone Ages and you'll find this little uh, uh, Venus of Willendorf, which interestingly is only about this big. And you can see it in Vienna in the museum. This is about 20,000 years old. And 20,000 years was before the dawn of agriculture. Uh, people were still essentially hunter-gatherers and pretty much knew what obesity looks like and this looks exactly like the patients that I would be seeing in my clinic today. So obesity as obesity is not a new phenomenon. It's always been there. It's always been part of, uh, you know, part of the uh, human phenotype. Uh, the difference is, of course, that this is now something that is far more common. Uh, people think that this was, uh, you know, an image that you know, perhaps played a role in, 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 in ceremonies. Perhaps this was even what they considered the mother goddess because it was a rare event. Uh, when somebody was able to accumulate this much fat and keep it, that was not something that was common. Uh, and even today you'll find in many societies that gaining weight is a sign of prestige. It's the, it's the richer upper class people uh, who gain weight. There's a, there's a difference in weight gain for men and women. Uh, men, when they put on weight, they're big and strong. Women, when they put on weight, they just get fat. Uh, so there's a different sociology around weight gain. Uh, that's quite specific to societies. Uh, but the point here is that this is not a new phenomenon. Obesity has been around for, for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, or some might actually say fortunately, and we have this, there's two sides of this coin, uh, it's become much, much more common. Uh, there was a paper in The Lancet uh, just, I think, a couple of weeks ago where they looked at the burden of disease across populations. And it turns out that we just had that tipping point where there's more people probably dying of overeating today than there are people dying of starvation. Uh, so we've, we've just kind of reached that uh, point where people would say, well, that's a great thing because dying of starvation was the problem for most people and still is for a considerable number of people. Uh, but for most of the world population, starvation is no longer the issue. In fact, now the problem is overconsumption. Uh, a lot of people think the U.S. is the fattest country in the world. It's not. Uh, there are pockets of obesity in other parts of the world that are uh, where the rates of obesity would be even higher than the southern United States. Uh, you can look at the Samoan Islands uh, where obesity is extremely common. Uh, but interestingly, and a lot of people miss this, is when you look at the Middle East, when you look at countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, lots of obesity there. And uh, there's obesity in Africa. There's obesity in South America. Now, interestingly, there's also a lot of obesity in Asia. Uh, it just doesn't look like it on this map, and that is because this map uses a definition of obesity, which is really a definition for white people. When we look at Caucasian definitions of obesity based on body mass index, we talk of a BMI of 30. Now, what we do know is that the health risk of excess weight for people from East Asia or South Asia is actually much greater. So for the same amount of weight gain, you will see health risks. You'll see someone from South Asia 
are much more prone to developing diabetes or much more prone to developing heart disease. Uh, if you use a lower cutoff, the one that you should be using for the South Asian and East Asian population, then the highest prevalence of obesity is probably in countries like India and China now and Korea and Japan, even where you, you find that there's quite a bit of obesity and that those numbers are continuing to increase. So we're not talking about something that's, you know, that's only happening here in North America or only happening in the US. This is, this is a global phenomenon. Some people speak of globesity as the problem. So when we think about what some of the drivers are and why is this happening on such a large scale pretty much around the whole planet, uh, it's hard to make local things responsible for that, you know, for those large changes. There's something happening at a global level across pretty much every society that you can think of that is promoting obesity and obesity is uh, certainly increasing pretty much everywhere. So that sets the stage for something that you know, brings us to the question of why is this happening? Because if you bring it down, if you boil it down to the physics, obesity is a question of energy in and energy out. If I consume more calories than I need, my body has this wonderful ability to take those extra calories and store them as fat tissue and make it available for me when I need it, which is a very sensible thing to have. Because if you think the old days when you were out there chasing after fast food, which was on four legs, uh, you know, if you were lucky enough to capture it, then there was no way to actually cool it or store it. There was no fridge that you could put it in. So you pretty much had to eat it or it would go bad. Now the nice thing is once you eat it and it turns into fat tissue, you can pretty much store it forever. Right? So I could still be living off a pizza that I had six months ago because it'll still be in my fat tissue. So it's actually a very sensible tissue to have. It's a, it's a very complex tissue, and it's, a, you know, it's something that, that evolutionary biology has come up with that makes a lot of sense. The problem now is that many of us, if you look at this from a purely calories in and calorie out perspective, uh, most of us are living on the positive side of that balance. Uh, part of it is because we might not be expending as many calories as before, and I'll talk about that. But on the other hand, we might be consuming more calories than before, and that might be having an impact. But there could also be changes to our metabolism and other things happening that make us more prone to storing extra excess calories than we might have been before. And those are the three possibilities. You're either eating too much, you're not moving enough, or your body is somehow doing something different than it used to do and is becoming more efficient in storing calories. And so those are the three possibilities that you want to consider. A lot of people are working on trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, when you look at this slide, it's, you know, it's easy. It's calories in, calories out. But what you really want to understand is why is that happening? You know, what are the determinants of calories in? And what are the determinants of calories out? And how does the individual fit into this? your decision-making, your own biology, appetite, hunger, all of that. And this was recently mapped out. And what you see here is, the, is an obesity map, which tries to put together all of the different things that could be contributing to weight gain and play a role in the obesity epidemic. And I know you can't read those individual parts. The point is it's, it's a pretty complicated map. There's lots, lots of things happening there. And you can break this down. You've got societal influences, you've got food production, you've got food consumption, you've got individual psychology, you've got individual activity levels, you've got the activity environment, and then you've got all of our biology that determines many of these activities. Uh, and what you can already see when you look at the complexity of this and when you start looking at how these things are interconnected, that there's no simple solution for this. When you have a problem, that is this interconnected when you try to change something at one end, unintended things happen somewhere else that are very hard to predict. And you're starting to see that in some of the social interventions and some of the, even some of the clinical interventions where you tell the patient one thing and you expect them to do one thing and they do it and then something else happens that you hadn't actually thought about or that you hadn't anticipated that would happen. And that very often happens 
when you, when, you, when you have social interventions or when you have interventions at a population level where you do something that you think is a good idea and then you find out years later that maybe that wasn't such a good idea. And I can give you a very specific example of that. Uh, one of them was when people in the 70s decided that the problem was, uh, at that time the concern was not obesity, the concern was heart disease, was eating too much fat. And so all the dietary recommendations came out and said you need to eat less fat. And industry responded, and industry produced a whole range of products that were low in fat. The problem, however, was that when you reduce the fat content of a food, you pretty much destroy the taste, because a lot of the taste of a food depends on its fat content. And so if you take the fat out of food, but still want people to eat it, you have to add something else that's going to you know, make it tasty. And so the industry responded, they took out the fat, but they put in sugar and they put in salt. Because it was only by putting in sugar and salt that they could get people to eat stuff that doesn't have fat in it. And so as a consequence of wanting to reduce fat intake in the population, you actually ended up increasing the sugar content in foods, and you ended up with a population that was eating more salt and more sugar than before. And now it turns out, and some people say that maybe this whole obesity thing is related to sugar, and really, part of why we have an obesity epidemic today was because of the recommendations to cut down on fat intake in the 70s. So that was a well-intended, sensible, based on the best data idea, where population folks thought, well, let's tell people to eat less fat, and maybe that's what caused the obesity epidemic. We don't know. Today, the focus is on sugar, and I'm quite sure that if you ban sugar, or you had policies to reduce sugar, either the fat will come back or something else will happen because in the end people are only going to buy and eat stuff that tastes good. And we're all designed to like fat, we like sugar, we like, uh, we, we like salt and you can't remove those three things from food because then it'll taste like cardboard. So you're pretty much stuck in that and that's what I mean by unintended consequences. You think you're doing the right thing but then something else happens and that is a, that is a typical feature of a complicated system, of a complex system. So having said that, there's no question that technology you know, has played a role in the development of obesity. And some of it is for very straightforward, simple reasons. When you look at the uh, figure, does anybody know who this is on the, on the two euro piece? Greek? Philippides, the marathon runner? This is the fellow who ran the first marathon because he ran actually he actually ran from Marathon to Athens to tell them about the victory of the war at Marathon. He's the guy who actually started the marathon. First marathon runner. Now we don't need marathon runners anymore. Because we had Graham Bell who came around and you know invented the, the telegraph. Had there been a telegraph, the marathon run would never have been run because you would have just sat there and tapped it in. We won the war, that's it, done. Today, you know, it's no longer the telegraph. Today it's wireless. You'd have a satellite. Actually, you could probably watch the pictures of the war as it is being won. So that's how technology changes things, and it reduces physical activity. Nobody would need to physically run a marathon today. Remember, the guy was not doing it for fun. He was not, this was not recreation. Right, there was a purpose that was running. And so when you think about the physical activity that goes into transportation, moving from A to B, how much energy does it take and how much effort does it take? How many calories do you burn doing that? Uh, and it's not just cars. We use elevators. We use escalators. And we come up with lots of ways of either not being physically active or reducing the amount of physical activity that we do. Uh, household work. I don't, did, any, did any one of you uh, notice last week, I think it was a week ago, there was quite a bit of uh, interest in this because uh, colleagues of mine down in uh, Baton Rouge had published a study where they looked at the time use and one of the things that they came up with was that the, uh, that the amount of calories burned by women when they do housework has come down dramatically over the last 40 or 50 years. And maybe that's really been one of the reasons why women have gained so much weight. 
Uh, and of course, this was, uh, you can imagine what was going on. <laughs> this was the New York Times that wrote that. And the blogosphere went wild, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, and they just said, well, you know, it's just been technology. You know, uh, and if you look at doing your laundry, and if you look at doing all of the household chores, um, and it's not just the chores that the women would do. You can look at the household chores that traditionally have been done by men. Even those chores have gone down because you've got, you've got a device, you've got ele electrical uh, gadgets for all of these. When you look at our kids, the time they spend out playing, you know, you throw them out there and they go off and play. Uh, today, it's not just that the, that the kids will play things that don't actually need a lot of uh, don't consume a lot of calories. We're also very nervous about them. We don't, uh, you know, there's this whole phenomenon of helicopter parenting that you don't, you kind of hover over your one or two offspring and you never let, really let go. And you could now actually say that, that is, part of that is media's fault because really in reality, kids have never ever in the history of human kind lived up in, a, uh, grown up in a world that has been safer than today. But every time before now, kids have actually been at way more uh, risk. But despite the fact that we live in the safest possible time to actually rear a kid, we are completely concerned about it and obsessed by the fact that something might happen. Now, why is that? Well, it's because of technology. It's because of the media. It's because if there's one, you know, if there's one pedophile stalker somewhere on the planet, we will know of that person's existence and it'll be on headline news for the next six weeks so that we are all convinced that it's completely unsafe outside. But in reality, it's never ever been safer. Right? So helicopter parenting is a phenomenon that is also directly related to technology and maybe the key single most important driver of childhood obesity. We don't let the kids be kids anymore. They're overscheduled, they're overplanned, and they live in a, and they're constantly being monitored. It used to be, you know, go out and play and don't come back till I, till I come back home. Today it is don't leave the house till I come back home. Right, it's completely changed. And so that's, part of that is technology. If you look at the workplace, where you had to actually physically lift things, where you had to move large objects, where you had to stand and do things. You were burning a lot of calories just doing that work. Offices today look very different. People in front of their computer screens, even what you would consider to have been factories. If you go to a factory today, very little physical labor. Go to a construction site today, very little physical labor. So I watched the guys who are building the, RT, the LRT station. They don't even climb a ladder anymore. They stand on a lift that takes them up. Oh, I need, I need something that's down there. The lift takes you down again. Right? So you've completely removed physical activity from this. People used to get paid to be physically active. Today, if you want to be physically active, it'll, it's going to cost you. Right? You've got to have the right outfit. You've got to have the right shoes. You need to hire the personal trainer so you don't make mistakes. Right? Sport, physical activity has become a massive industry. It's technology. Coming back to the hunters and gatherers, here you see three people trying to get some fast food. You actually had to work. And you'd have good days and bad days. And you'd have to invest a large part of your actual daily work would go into trying to feed your family. Today, you're still hunting and gathering. You're hunting for the bargain. You're gathering as much as you can to the little cart that you have. We still have big game hunters hunting for big game at Costco. Right? It's completely changed. You get as much as you want, as many things as you want, variety. Some people say variety is part of the obesity problem. Has anyone ever been to a buffet? What do you do at a buffet? You taste everything. Right? The more dishes, the more you're going to taste. 
And that's part of the problem. If there was one single, if you went to a buffet and there was one single dish, you'd be eating a lot less because you'll, maybe you'll take one plate and then, okay, maybe I'm still hungry, maybe I'll take a second plate. Well, now I'm really full, but I really like it, so maybe I'll take a third one. But then that's it. Now, if I've got 40 different dishes to try, you're not eating because you're hungry, you're just eating because you want to try all of them. If it's a potluck, you better try each one of them because if you don't, somebody's going to get upset. They'll unfriend you on Facebook. It's, uh, it's variety. It's the fact that we've got so many options that then make, it, make us want all of them. Part of the problem. And it's technology. Without the technology, you won't have this. Right? You won't have all of the variety that you have out there. And when you look at the foods that we eat, they're highly refined. And again, it's technology that allows you to do that take whole wheat and not just grind it into flour, but then actually removes everything from it so it ends up looking white, which is kind of strange. If you, because if you ever, ever look at ground flour, there's almost nothing white there. You've removed most of the stuff to make it white. But that's what you're eating, white bread. We drink juice. We don't eat fruit anymore. Why? Because eating fruit got to peel the stuff, you've got to go wash your hands, you've got to do stuff. And again, it's technology that allows you to do that. In fact, when you think of juice being imported, most of it when, when it comes and comes in deep frozen, it comes in, in frozen juice blocks. There's not some guy sitting in the store who's squeezing out the lemons, no. But it's mass production, it's technology. When you think about sugar, sugar used to be a very valuable and scarce commodity. When you start from the sugarcane plant where you start with the molasses and then you've got to, then you need the energy and you still, you're still going to end up with a brown sticky looking mass. Now to take that brown sticky looking mass and turn it into white sugar, that's crystalline. Lots of technology there. Right? But it's thanks to that technology that sugar today, like salt, costs nothing. Right, it's cheap, we've got abundant amounts of it. If I want to sell something that people would not otherwise eat, I'd just add sugar or salt. They'll buy it. It's cheap, it's easy, right? Thanks to technology. Here's, here's somebody we don't think about when we think about obesity. You know who this guy is? The clues in his hand. Thomas Edison came up with the electric bulb. Now, why is the electric bulb? Can anybody guess why the electric bulb has anything to do with obesity? You stay up later. Look at that. These guys should all be in bed. But they're not. Why? Because you'll stay up all night if you want. Go watch the late night show. Right? None of this would be possible without technology. You'd go to sleep maybe a couple of hours after the sun sets because you'll, you know, maybe you'll sit around at the, around the bonfire maybe for an hour or so and then it's bedtime and then off you go. And then when the sun comes up, you wake up. Right? Now why is this important? Because when you think of all of the societal changes that have happened in the last decades, one of the most profound changes is actually lack of sleep. We all sleep far less than we used to. Essentially, we're a, we're a society that runs on caffeine. Without your coffee, without your Coca-Cola, most of us would not function. Or we'd be asleep, we'd just sit there and sleep. Right? Because we're all chronically sleep deprived. Our kids don't sleep enough anymore. Bedtime used to be 6.30, 6 7 o'clock and you'd have afternoon naps. Nobody does that anymore. People used to have siestas. Doesn't happen anymore. Right? Again, it's all technology. Jet lag, time travel. It's technology. And the reason this is important is because we now understand that lack of sleep actually affects your metabolism. If you don't get enough sleep, your cravings go up, your appetite goes up, you don't have the energy to be more physically active. And it does change your metabolism. In fact, there was a recent paper from 
uh, from a colleague in Chicago who showed that even your cells need sleep, even your fat cells need sleep. Sleeping is essential. And when you have a sleep deprived society, you're going to end up with obesity as one of the side effects of not sleeping enough. And our kids are not sleeping enough. Fall asleep over their homework. And that has a direct impact. But none of that would be possible without, I mean, why would this kid be up if there was no light? Why would this kid be up if there was no technology? No, he'd be, he'd be in bed, he'd be in sleep. A lot of people say, well, you know, our, but it must be the environment genes haven't changed. Actually, the interesting thing is the genes might have changed. We always say the genes haven't changed. Well, they might have. And one of the faults, or one of the reasons that they might have actually changed at an almost societal level, especially in the kids, is maybe because of contraception technology. What has contraception technology allowed us to do? To choose. Choose what? Choose when to have kids. And how do most people choose? To have them to have them later. Right? Nobody, goes on oral, uh, nobody goes on contraception and says, I'm 14, I want a kid. No. The whole point of doing it is to delay pregnancies. Now, what is the impact of delaying pregnancies? What is, with, with the widespread availability of contraception, what has happened to maternal age at, when they have their first kid? It's gone up by almost a decade. Right? People used to have kids when they were 18, 19. Now you've, I'm sure you all have friends who are, you know, 30, 35 who are still, who still haven't had their first kid. Oh yeah, you know, after my PhD at 37, maybe I'll start a family. Right? Would not be possible without contraception technology. How does that affect the genes? Well, there's a phenomenon called epigenetics. And you've got to think of Epigenetics is being what actually fine-tunes your genetic program. And you can think of it as the following. So genetics is like a recipe. Right? You've got a cooking recipe, and it lists all the ingredients and how to do it. But how it actually gets done ultimately determines on what, do you, what happens with those ingredients, what happens with those steps. And everybody who's going to do it does it slightly differently. And epigenetics is that phenomenon that actually looks at the DNA and either turns certain genes on or turns them off or turns them on and off at a certain time period. And that happens with the genes. You can take two individuals and they're completely, they have exactly the same DNA and the same genetically identical. And you can change the environment and you'll end up with two individuals who are very different. And that's epigenetics. Now one of the things we've learned about epigenetics is that a lot of the, a lot of the biological phenomenon that are related to obesity, metabolism, appetite, maybe the biology of your adipose tissue. A lot of those things actually get programmed in utero and are influenced in utero by the health and the environment of the mother. In fact, in animal experiments, it's quite easy to demonstrate that what, you know, what a female animal eats before she gets pregnant will not only have an um, outcome, impact on the offspring, but even two generations later, you can still see significant differences in metabolism. And there's no question that, that the body of a 30-year-old is not the body of a 19-year-old. It's going to be less physically active, it's going to have more body fat, and a whole bunch of other things are going to be different. And so a, so a fetus that develops in a 30-year-old or a 35-year-old develops in an environment that is very different from the environment of a 17 or 18 or 20-year-old or 22-year-old. And that has changed dramatically. And that has only become possible because of contraception. So here you've got an example where there's a completely unsuspect, well-intended, everybody is for contraception, I'm all for it. Choice. But one unintended consequence of that may be that we are delaying 
birds, thereby promoting epigenetics, thereby promoting childhood obesity. Unintended consequences, right? You do something that you think is right and the right thing to do and something else happens. And it takes you a long time to realize that they might even be connected. So the genes have changed. Their expression has changed. We know that the epigenetic modifications to DNA, they can be transmitted from one generation to the next one. So when people say, well, you know, the genes couldn't have changed because it's been 20,000 years, whatnot, you can change, epigenetics can change genes in one generation very, very quickly. Which is why some people now say that if you wanted to really get serious about preventing childhood obesity, our focus needs to be on pregnancy. Our focus needs to be on young mothers. Because it's what the pregnant, it's, it's, it's the weight of the pregnant mother, whether she has diabetes, maybe what she eats during pregnancy, all of that can genetically program the offspring to be at a much higher risk of obesity than they would have otherwise been. Technology. We talk about toxins, bisphenol A. And it's not just in plastic. There's a whole, there's a whole range of chemicals out there that can change and disrupt metabolism by interfering with some of your hormone systems, by binding through those very same hormone receptors that were never intended for these products that are out there, thereby again changing your metabolism. Here's one of the slides I never understand. The correlation here is between obesity and the consumption of bottled water. Bottled water, the drinking bottled water is causing obesity. Who believes that? Nobody does. Right on. I don't even know if it's causal, of course not, because it's, it's an association study. Maybe just a society, as we have started drinking more bottled water, well, a lot of things have changed, but interestingly enough, over that same time period, obesity has gone up. Now, the funny thing is, this is bottled water. If I showed you sugar sweetened beverages, the line would not be that steep at all because that consumption has actually not changed a lot over the time. Right? And I'm not saying it's the water that's the problem. Maybe it's the bottle or maybe it's the lifestyle that people who drink bottled water have. That's the problem. Right? Never, 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 never jump to conclusions about any kind of causality by looking at correlations. It, they never mean anything. Antibiotics, technology, agricultural technology. Now part of why you would use antibiotics in food husbandry is because by changing the gut flora of those animals, you can make them more fuel efficient. They gain more weight. Now interestingly enough, we also have intestinal flora. All of us carry in our intestines bacteria. We have more bacteria in your gut than you have cells in your body. And it now turns out that those bacteria, they, just, they, they don't just sit there. They actually help with digestion. They secrete molecules that will interfere or that will actually support digestion absorption of foods. And we also know that there's a lot of variability in the bacteria that people have in their guts. It's almost like a fingerprint. And there's now a lot of research showing that thin people have different gut bacteria than large people. In fact, there have even been fecal transplant studies where they've taken stool from a fat person and put it and given it to a skinny person and vice versa, and you actually change metabolism. So again, the question is, are the antibiotics that are used in farming, and even if you don't eat meat, where, does, where do those antibiotics go? The, the animals pee them out. They end up in the water. They end up in the environment. So whether, you, whether you're vegetarian or vegan, it doesn't matter, you would still be exposed to those same material because they're everywhere. Maybe they're affecting 
your gut flora. Maybe, let's get back to unintended consequences. Maybe it's all our hand washing and our germophobia that is changing our gut floras. When you used to eat off the ground and not wash your hands, you probably had very different germs sitting in your intestine than now that everything is sanitized and sterilized and again unintended consequences. Right? We clean up everything, we've got food safety inspectors running around, we wash our hands, we use antiseptics, disinfectants. Maybe that's changed our gut bacteria. Interesting. And of course, there's pharmaceuticals. Again, lots of pharmaceuticals, lots of medications that people take and cause weight gain. And again, a lot of those pharmaceuticals end up in the environment. You pee them out. Right? And so they float around. We know the oral contraceptives, for example, they float around and there's no actual talk about whether the estrogens that are being peed out by women who take them are affecting salmon husbandry. Those are the quantities that are out there. Technology. PDAs. Time-saving devices. I've, I've yet to buy a device that actually saves me time. Because every device you buy actually takes more time. It's one of those funny things. The more you own, the more time you end up, the less time you have. Every time you buy something, if you actually intend using it, that's going to cost you time. Everything. If you go buy a new camera, well, if you, use, you actually want to use the camera, it's going to cost more time. And technology might make certain things easier, but they never end up saving you time. Never, ever. I've never seen technology that ever saves anybody time. It doesn't happen. Stress levels, well, we all have that. Multitasking, trying to do too many things at the same time. Running on caffeine, not enough sleep, feeling guilty about all the stuff we think we should be doing or are trying to do, never get around to doing them. And I'll leave you with this one. Room temperature, ambient temperature. Anybody know why that is important? Why does room temperature maybe have something to do with obesity? Has anybody ever heard of brown adipose tissue? Okay, Brown adipose tissue is a special type of fat tissue that is not there to store fat. It's there to burn fat. And when it burns fat, it produces heat and warmth. And because we are warm-blooded, beings, we need that internal generation of, of heat. And most adults don't have a lot of brown adipose tissue. But they do when they have cold exposure. Here's an experiment. When you take adults, cold expose them, they start growing more brown adipose tissue. Now, brown adipose tissue is highly metabolically active. A couple of ounces of, met, of brown adipose tissue can burn four, five, six hundred calories. Huge amounts of calories. But that's all this tissue does. It just burns calories. And so one of the hypotheses is that because we now all live in an ambient temperature where we no longer actively have to control, our body no longer has to control our temperature because we're already doing most of the job using our heating systems or air conditioning systems. We've lost the brown adipose tissue, which means that a large consumption, a tissue that would naturally have been there to protect us from obesity, that would have naturally burned off excess calories, we no longer have because we all live in these environments where we are, we're not really cold anymore. So interesting. So this slide pretty much summarizes a lot of these factors, and you can see that all of the factors that I've talked about as the obesity epidemic, and I'll just point this out, uh, when you look at this red line here, this is the obesity prevalence that has gone up. And all of these other lines, they represent the things that I've talked about. The green line here, antidepressant prescriptions, the average home temperature, the uh, uh, 
age of mothers at firstborn. You can see that happening here. Uh, the prevalence of air conditioners. The more air conditioners we have, the more heating systems we have, obesity has gone up. Uh, time spent awake, again. So all of these things that I've talked about, none of which would have happened without technology. And not recent technology, technology that came out of the Industrial Revolution, things that have been happening in the last 200 years. Because one of the biggest myths about the obesity epidemic is that it started maybe 20 years ago. It didn't. The obesity epidemic started in the, towards the later part of the, of, of the 18th century with the start of industrialization. Now, we, now there was the Depression, and then there was World War I, and then there was World War II, and so there were dips. But if you extrapolate the data across the full range, you can see that the obesity epidemic didn't start in the last 10 years, or last 20 years, or last 30 years, or last 40 or 50 years. It's been, it's been pretty much climbing for the last 100, 150 years. And most of that has been because of technology. Because technology ultimately determines not just whether we are physically active or not, but all of the other things that I've talked about. So it's something to think about. So I want to leave you with this, that uh, we definitely do have a crisis. I mean, there's no question that obesity is affecting a lot of people's health. It's affecting them uh, in a lot of different ways that we won't have time to talk about. But we've got to do something about it. Now, the problem with this is, what are you going to do? Because again, think about those interconnected systems. Like where are you going to start in that web and what is it that we want to do less of? Like I can tell you for sure, nobody wants to get rid of electric light. I don't think a lot of people are out there who want to go get two hours of additional sleep. I don't think anybody wants to give up their PDAs. I know whether people want to drink less bottled water. Uh, I don't know that parents are going to stop obsessing about their little kids and let them play outside. I don't think that any women want to go back having kids when they were 17. So where do you want to start? Like which piece of this puzzle are you going to take and unpack and start addressing? Right? It's a great problem to have because this is a problem that we can be working on for a long time. It's not no easy solutions. OK, so I did talk about the, uh, my Facebook page. I also have a blog that I write about obesity pretty much every day. Uh, this just happens to be an article on lack of sleep. If you go to the website, you can, all, you can just put your email address here, subscribe, or like my page on Facebook if you want. All right, thanks so much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Hi, thanks very much. Whoa. That's loud. Um, that, was, that was a very interesting talk. Thanks very much. Um, I, I'm, I was curious, I have a question about something that you didn't really go into too much detail about, which is childhood obesity. During my undergrad uh, in physiology, we were, we were told that, uh, that one of the predominant reasons for this is because of um, the hyperplasic state of adipose cells in the, in the younger generation and because they're consuming more calories. I was just curious as to what you thought the impact uh, that was having was. Well, I mean, all of, the, all of the things that I've talked about uh, would apply to kids too. They're act not getting enough sleep, not being active enough, uh, eating a lot of refined foods, uh, variety, uh, parents who are not there or too busy with other things, uh, safety concerns, playing outside. All of those are issues that as much apply to the kids as not. The things that I haven't talked about very much are the mental health issues. Uh, which play a big role in obesity in adults, but also play a big role in kids. I haven't talked about attention deficit disorder, which is, in adults has been very clearly associated with risk for weight gain. Uh, there's no reason why ADHD would also not be, be a predisposing factor for kids. Uh, so there's lots of issues. I mean, you know, I think if, if nothing else, what you can take away from the, this talk is that obesity is not, a, is not a simple matter of people eating too much and not moving enough. Uh, there, there, is, uh, there, there is such a complexity and there's such a multi-layer level of interactions between a lot of different things that happen, our own biology, the environments we live in. Things like room temperature might interact to cause this problem and they also apply to the kids. And so I don't think that you can treat or solve the obesity problem in isolation by looking at the kids or trying to focus on the kids. Uh, the biggest risk factor for childhood obesity is having an obese adult. And 
So if you say the cause of childhood obesity is the obese adult, well, then you don't treat the kid, you treat the adult. All right, thanks. I just have one more question. Um, I was just curious as to um, whether there was any uh, sort of specific metabolic reasons for the differences in ethnicities uh, between the threshold. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are differences in the ethnicity. So, for, for example, if you, uh, you know, I alluded to this earlier, uh, the fact that people, in, that Asians seem to be much more prone to developing uh, health problems when they accumulate body fat. Uh, and some of this might be related to the fact that when Asians accumulate body fat, it tends to, uh, they tend to put most of that fat inside their abdomens uh, and not so much under their skin. Uh, a lot of Caucasians, when they gain weight, they'll put a lot of the fat under their skin or they'll put lower body obesity. In Asians, most of that fat seems to just go here. And, and you'll see this typically if you look at uh, some of the people from East Asia that you might know. They're pretty skinny, but they'll have a little pot belly here. That's where all the fat is, and it's just a couple of pounds of fat. And they'll have skinny arms and skinny legs. Uh, but that extra fat that they have right here is enough to make them diabetic. Uh, on the other extreme, you'll find patients, we see them in our clinic, you know, who are carrying 200 extra pounds of fat, right? And they've got big arms and big legs and big buttocks, and it's all over. And they're big and huge, massive. And they don't have any metabolic problems. They never get diabetes, right? So again, it has to do with these differences. Now, why is it that the Asians tend to deposit their fat more abdominally than in, underneath their skin? Maybe it's gen genetic. Uh, maybe, those are, maybe there's other differences. I don't know. Great. Thanks very much. So we often, we, uh, we often in this course talk about extremely complicated things. And it's more satisfying if we think that we might have at least a glimpse of a solution, a solution rather than absolutely no solution anywhere in the room. So where should we look for a solution? Is the, the focus on personalized medicine and on the condition of the individual patient with their own gut flora and their own genetics, their own background? Is that where we should focus? Should we focus so th on society? Yeah. Where? So, I, so I think there's different, you know, there's different aspects. I think, uh, you know, societal changes, of course. Now, if I was confident which of the societal factors was really the biggest driver and how you could change that, I would be much more enthusiastic about societal change because I don't know what you want to change. But yeah, you can do things. You can take pop out of schools and you can, uh, you know, maybe bring phys ed back into classes. So far, the intervention studies that have done that have shown either a very small or a very modest effect. Uh, but I think they're important. Uh, I think the hope is not going to come in how can we make society thinner again. I think the question is going to be far more how can we get people, irrespective of what their size is, to still have the maximum health that they have. Because they're not incompatible. We know that there's a lot of large people out there who are pretty healthy. We know that uh, when people get ill, it's generally the large people who tend to survive better. And they tend to live much longer than the skinny people who all die first. Uh, we know that uh, a large person who's physically active is probably way healthier than a skinny person who doesn't. Right? So uh, we don't have to be skinny to be healthy. In fact, it's the skinniness, the skinny people die first, always. So, it's, uh, so my optimism lies in that and saying that you know, if we all ate better, and if we slept longer, and if we felt better about ourselves, and if we spent some of our social activities actually socializing in person, and if we uh, got more physically active, uh, if we worked on work-life balance, a lot of us would get a lot healthier. Uh, we might not lose any weight at all, but uh, we would be a lot healthier. And so I think that if the focus is on improving health of the population, I see a lot of possibility of hope. If the, if the question is, how do we make society thinner, uh, I'm not sure I have an answer. One, one of the things I, I've commonly seen as a kind of direct effect of the, the excellent presentations that you give is that the people in the audience suddenly realize how prejudiced they are against fat people and that maybe it doesn't make sense to hold those views and yet when they look inside themselves 
they find this extremely hard to change. Now, yeah. is, is this one thing we should focus on? Should, should, should we all in, the, in this room think the next time we see a fat person, we won't assume that they're lazy, that yeah. they're unhealthy, that, you know, that, that there's really something morally wrong with them, we'll realize. It, so would, would that do any good? Is it possible to change that? Or are these, you know, feelings we all have of, yeah. you know, prejudice against fat people almost yeah. as hard to change as many of the other hard to change things that you're talking yeah, it's, about. It's hard to change, but we should try to change it, first of all, because it's wrong. It's morally wrong. I mean, um, when I just look at this from a healthcare perspective, uh, you know, when I have a patient come in who's large and who's got a healthcare problem, I need to look after that patient the same way that I would look after any other person. Uh, and it's completely irrespective of whether this is something that is self-inflicted or not, because that's the notion. The notion that the, the two underlying problems when it comes to obesity, why we have a prejudice, is the first one is we think that they've done this to themselves. And if they were motivated enough, they could do something about it and could cure it, right? That's the, that's, those are the two assumptions, right? And so really it becomes a question of, okay, whose responsibility is this? And if you're doing this to yourself and we have a public health care system, should, the tax, uh, should my taxes go towards treating your problem? Now that is a question that should be asked because you need to ask that question if you're going to ask the question about everybody. Should I be paying for the guy who broke his hip uh, doing some stupid downhill skiing? Or like what the hell was he doing on skis and why was he on a slope? Uh, right? Uh, why should I be paying for that guy? Uh, why should I be paying for the fellow who went you know, got into a car accident driving, driving 20 kilometers over the speed limit, not wearing a seat belt. Like, why would I pay for that fellow's injury? Uh, why would I pay for the fellow who gets breast cancer or who gets uh, skin cancer or gets something else when I know that, uh, you know, not having a healthy lifestyle is one of the biggest risk factors for getting those problems? Why would I pay for that guy's health care, right? Why would I pay for anything? 90% of the patients, if I'm going to ask, well, you know what, so you've got this infection, yeah, did you actually wash your hand? I mean, did you know there was an infection? Why did you go there? Like, did you actually get your flu vaccine? Uh, did you see the guy was coughing in the line and yet you, you know, you, you still got on that airplane? Uh, if you're going to start asking those kind of questions, then you might as well stop doing healthcare, right? Because everybody, uh, you know, has the responsibility, or oh, they don't, right? And if they don't, then you have to treat everybody the same. You say, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you smoke 40 years and got lung cancer. Now that you have lung cancer, I need to treat it. Uh, so even if obesity was self-inflicted, which it's not, but even if it was, that argument would not hold because you'd have to apply it right across the brand. So making that argument and making that distinction, say, you know, just because he's a fat guy, I'm not going to treat his diabetes till he loses weight. Or because he's fat, I'm not going to give him a new hip till he goes and loses 100 pounds. But the skinny guy, oh yeah, that's a, you know, that's a better person, I'll do it. But that is, that is prejudice. And that's just not fair. That's, that's, that's just not right. Now, in terms of controllability, there's also this assumption that if, well, if you only wanted, you could go and lose the weight and keep it up. Because we've all heard stories about somebody who's done it. And we've all seen the biggest loser. When data actually tells us that out of 20 people who go and diet and exercise and try to lose weight, if you look at them two or three years later, 19 out of the 20 will have put the weight back on. It is almost impossible to do. And the few people who do manage to lose a lot of weight and keep it off, just with diet and exercise, and we know what these people do because in the US they actually have, colleagues of mine in Colorado, they, they run something called the National Weight Control Registry, which is funny, they have a weight control registry, they don't have a gun registry. They have a weight control registry. And we know what the people in that registry do. They eat about 14, 1500 calories a day, and they exercise about 2,800 calories a week, which is 400 calories a day. That is, you know, 1,500 calories, that's not even a happy meal. That's all they eat. And 400 calories, burning, anybody who's ever done that, that's, that's a pretty decent amount of exercise. And a lot of these guys don't just do 400 calories. They, become, they train for Ironman competitions, they run marathons, they've completely changed their life. That's the amount of, that's what, actually, that's what it actually takes to keep the weight off. Because losing weight is never the problem. Anybody can go and lose weight, and there's a million commercial programs that you can sign up for, and you'll lose weight on all of them, right? But not one of those programs will guarantee that you keep the weight off. That is the problem in weight management. It's never about how do I get a patient to lose weight. It's always how do I get the patient to keep the weight off. 
That's where the technology is going to come in. That's where bariatric surgery comes in. That's where medications will probably come in. Uh, because that is the problem. It's never losing weight. And so when it comes back to bias and prejudice, we think people should be able to do this when in fact there's actually no evidence that people can actually do it. And the rare people who can do it, some might call them crazy. Right? So when you put the two together, the expectation, well, it's self-inflicted, so he doesn't deserve treatment. And if he was really wanted to, you could probably go lose the weight and keep it off. Well, both of those assumptions are actually wrong. But they underlie our whole weight bias and discrimination piece. So in, in some instances, isn't it true that uh, obese people had, you know, addictions before which they have uh, overcome, and now, you know, obesity is what's left, yeah. but it may not be as life-threatening as what they were doing previously. Yeah. Is obesity, so, so is obesity a form of harm reduction? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's interesting in the context of, uh, that's actually interesting in the context of smoking cessation, because a lot of people who give up smoking will put on weight. And the argument is always, what's more dangerous, right? Is it putting on the weight or smoking? Now, for the smokers, I can tell you that you need to put on about 50 or 60 pounds after you stop smoking to even come close to the risk that you had with smoking one cigarette. So, uh, so the risk of the, the, the health risks associated with smoking are far worse than anything you can possibly imagine compared to the risk of being overweight or obese. Uh, but having said that, uh, when you think about addictions, uh, not everybody who has extra weight is, has food addiction. But food addiction as a phenomenon exists because, and, and that's not surprising because a lot of the foods that we talk about, the highly palatable food, chocolate, uh, you know, the sweets, they stimulate exactly the same reward centers in your brain that would be stimulated by, by all of the things that you can get addicted to, whether it's drugs or sex or alcohol or gambling. And you see that quite often that when people give up those addictions, they put on a lot of weight because they haven't actually given up addiction, they've just given up that addiction and have now moved to a food addiction and the weight's gone up. And sometimes the reverse happens. You do bariatric surgery on some of these patients and you take away their food and they go back to their old addiction. Well, you haven't actually cured the addiction, you're just moving them from one addiction to another. Uh, because treating addiction is very difficult. The, the, the special problem with food addiction is that if you have, if, if you have an addiction, say, against you know, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, whatever, you can stop those. It's not easy to do and you might need help, but you can. I mean, you, know, you have the option of never smoking another cigarette. You have the option of never, never taking another shot of heroin. You have the option of never setting foot in a casino again. With food addiction, you don't have that option. You know, I can't say, oh, sorry, you got a food addiction, no more food for you, you're done. Well, it doesn't work. Abstinence does not work for food addiction, right? And so, really, if you think of it, the addiction model, this would be like taking an alcoholic and giving them, say, you know what, you've, you know, you're an alcoholic, so uh, I need you to follow this drinking plan, right? It's going to be one shot for breakfast, and then it's half a bottle of wine for lunch, and then, you know, you can have two pints for supper, but then there's no drinking after 8 p.m. Well, you know, you want to see the alcoholic who can do that, right? But that's what you're doing with someone who has food addiction. Well, here's your eating plan. Here's the plan I need you to follow. Well, that's not going to work, right? The approach has to be different. Uh, and so it's, it's a great point. I mean, not all our patients, you know, have food addictions, but, but there are a lot of patients, you ask them, you know, do you think you, are you addicted to food? Yeah. You know, I think about it a lot. It's there. If I don't see it, I don't get it. I start feeling nervous. I, you take it away. I, I get these panic attacks. I mean, it's, I go through withdrawal symptoms. It's, it's just like an addiction. And you have those patients. And you're not going to treat them by giving them a diet plan. It doesn't work. Uh, a good point. Um, there's a, a hormone leptin has attracted the attention of the researchers for years. Uh, I'm curious, have you ever done any research of the influence of the modern technology or modern lifestyle to the secretion of leptin sure. or in any uh, genetic yeah. aspect of the leptin of the overweight or obesity? Yeah. So there's a, that's a great question. I mean, there are, these are complex systems, right? There's not one hormone or there's not one molecule that controls things like hunger and appetite and satiety and all that stuff. I mean, these are, there's a whole bunch of these hormones out there. Uh, and each of them individually plays a role. 
The problem clinically is, and this also works in, uh, is also the problem in animal models, is that because these are very complex biological systems, they're also very redundant, which means that when you knock out one molecule, well, there's 10 other molecules that, that'll step in and do the same job. And so things that in animal studies that you found to be very effective, like you take a knockout mouse, so you find a molecule and say, this is the NP NPY receptor, which is you know, really important for regulation of hunger. Okay, you knock it out, and you look at the mouse, nothing happens. Same weight, same everything. Now, if you challenge the mouse and put it on a special diet, you might actually start seeing differences, but the normal mouse, why? Because there's other receptors, they'll just do the same job. And that is the problem in obesity, that you've got a very, because it is so important, right? I mean, being able to take up calories and store them, and when you don't get food, to look, go out and look for food, and every time there's food, you want to eat as much of the food as you can, and you don't want to waste your time you know, chewing on leaves and salads when there's gravy. Uh, you know, that is a normal behavior that you're genetically programmed for, and there's a, there's a very complicated multi-layered system that'll ensure that that is what happens. And so when you start knocking out that system with pharmacological drugs or start you know, using hormones, those other hormones that are there, the, the, you know, that system will just readjust and, and will compensate. And that's what happens to everybody who loses weight. You know, nobody loses weight until they disappear. You go on any diet and you start losing weight initially, and then after a couple of weeks in the diet, your weight levels off. And that is physiology, and see, that's, and that's the difference between, between physics and physiology. If it was physics, you know, so if I took my car and I said, you know what, I want to get my car to run on less gas, and so what I'm going to do is from now on, I'm only going to fill the tank, you know, uh, I'm only go, going to buy half a, half a tank of gas every time I go. Right? And if I do that long enough, my car will learn to run on less gas. That will never happen with your car. With your body, it'll happen. If I start eating less, my body will readjust. Say, today I need 2,000 calories. If I start eating 1,500 calories, if within a couple of weeks, my body will actually run on 1,500 calories. And I'll be pr pretty much be able to do almost everything I was doing before on 1,500 calories. Because my metabolism will adjust to just needing 1,500 calories. Your car will never do that. And that's the difference between physiology and physics. And that's why the whole energy in, energy out stuff that works great for physics doesn't work for humans because we adapt. We are adaptive systems. Because your body wants to protect you from starving or losing weight or something. Is that, Pardon me? Is that because of your body wants to uh, protect you from... Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. So my metabolic rate goes down, temperature goes down, my spontaneous activity level decreases, my hunger appetite goes up. All of those counter responses happen. In fact, I even get more fuel efficient. So one of the things that happens when you lose weight is that the amount of energy I need for the same amount of work dramatically decreases. And that's not just because I'm getting lighter and I'm carrying less weight. No, I have to get more fuel efficient. My mitochondria will actually get more efficient. Right? So that when I'm big and I walk a thousand steps, I burn a certain amount of energy. When I lose weight and walk 10,000 steps, I burn a lot less energy which is part of the problem. So when I start an exercise program, I start losing weight, and then I find that I'm still doing the same amount of exercise, but not only am I not losing weight, my weight is actually starting to come back, and I'm still doing that same amount of exercise. Well, that's because my body has become so much more efficient. Right? And, that's, and that is fundamental to understanding why we don't have good treatments for obesity, because your body is going to counter-regulate whatever it is that you try to do in terms of trying to move the body weight. Yeah, I was um, curious as to what your first line clinical strategy was for treating your patients. If you, you know, if you take this, your standard patient A, he's yep. got, he's overweight, risk factors, uh, what's, what's your go-to? Yeah, so what's the plan? standard strategy? The first, the first thing is you want to understand what's causing the weight gain, because there's lots of different reasons why somebody's gaining weight. Uh, you know, somebody who's gaining weight because they're not eating breakfast is a different problem than somebody who's gaining weight because they have depression. And that's a different problem than someone who has a food addiction or someone who's on medication causing them to gain weight or somebody who doesn't know that the bottle of alcohol they drink every day has calories. Those are five different problems. And each one of those problems needs a different approach. So the first thing that you would do in approaching anybody with obesity is try to figure out what is actually driving their weight problem. And that's what you're going to address first. And how do you know you're successful? You'll know you're successful when they stop gaining weight. 
And once they stop gaining weight and you think you've addressed the underlying problem, then you come to the next step and say, okay, fine, now how do we get some weight off and how do we keep it off? And that, that, that becomes a generic problem and that's a different problem. But the first step has always, always has to be, do we understand why this person has a weight problem? So do you use um, weight or mass as, a, as an indicator of, of, or do you use exercise capacity or a combination? None of those are, none of those are ultimately, uh, none of those are going to tell me what the problem is. Right? The problem is going, uh, it's going to be more uh, asking the right questions that are going to explain why somebody has a weight problem. Uh, the, the, there's no tests that I can do that are going to tell me. Because what is exercise capa capacity going to show me? It's going to show me that this person is not very physically active, which he'll tell me. I mean, as a, as a measure, like, for their progress? Sure, as an outcome measure, you can do that. Yeah. But, you, but you can do exercise capacity, you can do the six-minute walk test. I mean, there's different ways of looking at, you know, is somebody getting healthier? Um, but they don't, they don't help with the treatment. The treatment is still going to come back to the, what is actually driving the weight, and what is the strategy that I can use to try and reduce weight in a manner that becomes sustainable? And diet and exercise will normally give you a very modest weight loss that you can sustain. And Thanks. that's why you could then go off to bariatric surgery, and I wish we had better medications. We don't have good medications for obesity. Oh, the difference is between the Canadians and Americans. Uh, I don't know. If you look at all of the things that I've talked about, there could be a number of possibilities, right? Uh, maybe their lives are even more stressful than ours. Uh, maybe the, uh, you know, maybe they spend even more time commuting in their cars and being less physically active than us. Maybe there's maybe there's cultural differences. Uh, Poverty, I haven't spoken about any of the socioeconomic drivers of obesity. There's huge differences there. Uh, there's differences in ethnicity. So, you know, all of the things that I've talked about could be slightly different, right? And it's not just that the, all of America is, is fatter than Canada. I mean, there are pockets of obesity there in the same way that we have huge obesity problems in our Aboriginal population. If you go into our reserve, you're looking at 40% of obesity. Uh, huge numbers. I mean, numbers that are as high as in the southern U.S. So there's pockets of obesity everywhere. Usually when you go in and start looking at what's actually going on there, there's always a good reason why it's happening. All right. Um, do you think as we approach the singularity, obesity will continue to rise, or do you think you might find <laughs> some crazy... As we approach the singularity, we'll be, going, we'll be all sitting in those little airborne things. Kind of thing. <laughs> Remember Wally? <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't think, I hope that that's not what happens. I mean, I, I, I do hope as we uh, uh, approach the singularity, which from a technology point means that more people will have access to more things, uh, that we will uh, manage, somehow manage to be healthier despite everything else, right? But if the singularity ends up in us being even more busy than we already are, in us having even more options than we already have, in us spending even less time to sleep because there's more things to do, uh, then we are going to have a problem. Unless you actually then step in and say, okay, fine, maybe the singularity allows us to do individualized medicine and we can find what hormone and what receptor is doing what. But I don't see, you know, I don't, I don't see a scenario right now where we would be coming up with so many diverse treatments for obesity that everybody who has a weight problem would be treated. And at a population level, I'm very skeptical as to what, where we can make the big changes. When it comes to weight loss, I'm not skeptical that we can improve the health of the population because we've done that before, we can do it again, and we can continue doing that. Can we make Canada thinner? That I'm not sure of. I'm not even sure of do we have to make Canada thinner to make, them, to make Canada healthier. I'm not even sure of that. We're, we're uh, out of time. Thank you very, very much for an excellent session.